Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord has what feels like an infinite number of ways to play the game. From a trade empire to a Sturgian boyar or a Vlandian banner knight, you can roleplay a million different styles for your campaign. Now whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, making a new playthrough is an exciting and fun experience. You get to craft the future of your next uh, hundred or so hours of Calradian bliss. But with that come a number of pitfalls, ones that I'm sure we've all stepped into a number of times while playing without even noticing it. In this video today, I'm going to go through six ways to really improve and streamline your start in Mountain Blade 2 so that you have an easier and more enjoyable and less grindy mid to late game. So let's get started with the list in the character creation screen. Success for your character starts right out the gate. With six cultural backgrounds to choose from, you might be wondering what one is best to select. There truly is no best option, and if you're trying to roleplay a specific style of character, feel free to go with that one by all means. But I will say the two that are the strongest, in my opinion, are the Valandian one, which will enable you to quickly train up troops in the event that you lose a lot of your army, that 20% more upgrade XP to troops from battles is huge, or the Azirian one, which will allow you to secure passive income quickly or create your own personal trade lane with relative ease. Uh, those caravans at 30% cheaper to build is very nice, as well as that 10% less trade penalty. Now, don't be afraid to choose any of the others, but as of right now, Sturgia is currently the worst cultural affinity. But outside of these bonuses, the background will determine what skill points you'll get through the other stages of creation such as Sturgia being the only background which can start with 50 roguery or 5 focus points at the start of the game. Most of this isn't crucial though, but I just wanted to note that for you so that you knew coming into your character creation phase. Our second point is party wages. Now it can be easy to immediately upgrade all of your troops to their max level quickly. But if this isn't your first playthrough, you're probably getting a lot better at the combat portion of the game. If not, please check out my guide on that in the upper right corner for battle commands. If you spend too much time upgrading your troops to max, you'll quickly find that you can't sustain your party because you're hemorrhaging too much money too quickly because not a lot of your soldiers are dying because you're just better at the game. With the most recent set of patches, your companions, even your wife, now cost a daily income that matches their companion level. So, some of these really nice companions with 100 plus skill points will cost you 40 to 50 dinar a day. While not a lot, spread that across 4 companions, that's 200 dinar a day and can add up quickly. What you should be doing is keeping all of your troops at a max of tier 3, maybe tier 4 depending on the troop, until you can secure enough passive income or you're confident enough in what you're making to push to the higher tiers. Take this playthrough for example. I have 38 out of 51 troops, and my daily cost is only 184 dinar a day. That's already less than what 4 high level companions would cost me. If you'd like to see what your party costs you daily, you can hover over the dinar symbol in the lower right corner here, or click this little up arrow in the far right corner to get more detailed information and you'll get your daily party wage right there. All that brings me to our third point, passive income. Passive income is extremely important in the beginning portions of Bannerlord. If you don't establish it quickly and your army becomes too elite or large, you'll be constantly playing catch up, trying to run short trade routes for small gain, or constantly selling arena prizes in hopes of getting ahead of the constant drain on your purse. Now there are three forms of passive income, mercenary contracts, caravans, and workshops. The mercenary contracts are really not a reliable form of income as they will fluctuate every handful of days and with the most recent nerfs to influence, they hardly generate money. Caravans are a great source of income, but I'd argue that they are better at helping growing your existing revenue channels because the requirement to start one up, if you're not a, of the Azerian background, is 15,000 dinars or 22,500 for the more elite caravan, which you'll want. Furthermore, they take a little time to start, returning money as well as locking down one of your companions that acts as the caravan leader. No, the real king here is workshops. As of the creation of this video, the tannery makes the most money for you, with a brewery coming in a kind of close second here. 
These will cost you around 13 to 16,000 dinars, but will start producing returns very fast. Also, they're safe from being attacked by bandits or enemy nations. My one word of caution would be to establish a workshop in a city that you know you're not looking to be at war with in the scope of your campaign. For example, if I'm doing a Batanian playthrough, I don't want to put a workshop in the Western Empire because we'll probably be at war with them. This will destroy your workshop. And as you can see right here, I've got two tanners, both making over 400. This is on the patch 1.4.1, and the Ironmonger is simply making six. This gives you a frame of reference to how much more successful a tanner can be than a lot of the other workshops. Our fourth point is quests. Now, in addition to securing passive income, try and maintain a constant rotation of quests in the villages you frequently visit to recruit troops. This has a number of bonuses to you as the player. For one, the relative power, if I hover over one of these guys, I can see power influential, 164. Uh, this will increase, resulting in better recruits, especially if that village has any of the prestigious uh, noble lines that are exclusive to some villages. Second, it will increase the relations with the inhabitants, helping you access more of the recruits within the village. As you can see, I've got zero relation with Udris here. Now if I jump to recruits, that means I only get access to the first three columns. As I increase this relation, it needs five, it's 10, and then it needs 20 in the final column here. But third, it will provide you with a bit of income, especially quests like Family Feud, Find My Daughter, or Deserters, which will net northwards to 1,000 gold with each completion. You'll quickly find that this amount of money isn't really worth it, but it can add up fast, and you'll, be access to, you'll have access to better recruits in the latter portions of your game. If you feel brave enough, you can tackle the bandit camp quests for a hefty relation bonus, a good deal of loot, and a large gold reward. I'll refer to my guide on the bandit camps again in the upper right corner if you need help tackling some of those. The fifth point is skills and attributes. Now this next tip is a bit of an advanced one, and if this is your first time playing the game, I strongly encourage you just to play the game and experiment with everything. Restarting the campaign is actually a feature of Mountain Blade, so don't worry. But if this is one of your many playthroughs, you should really be optimizing your social and intellect based skills right out of the gate. Remember, in Bannerlord, your attribute points do not contribute to your skills in any way outside of learning speed. So higher vigor doesn't make for more melee damage. So you should spend the majority of your time, especially in the beginning of the game, focusing on skills such as trading, medicine, and steward. Uh, tactics and leadership will start to increase as you lead armies when you're a vassal or running your own kingdom, so don't worry about them at the start. Now, it's hard to see this, but most characters stall around level 14 or 15 because every character level requires a certain amount of skill points before you can progress to the next character level. For instance, level 1 to level 2 takes 10 skill points, but level 15 to 16 requires 80 skill points as you can see here. The further this point, the higher your character level, the slower you learn skill points. So if you spend all of your early levels, attribute points, and focus points on nothing but combat skills, your progression will reach a massive stalling point because your combat levels will become few and far between as your more passive skills, the intellect and social based ones, will match that slow learning rate. Remember. Your combat and transport skills, like riding and athletics, will increase at a fast rate because you'll constantly be using them as long as you're engaging in combat with the respective skills. Skills such as steward require high food variety and morale. Trade requires you to buy low and sell high. Medicine requires you to heal wounded units. So there are much more specific criteria that are required to level those skills. If you find yourself getting into the early teens level-wise and are really slowing down, I encourage you to switch to a set of weapons you have zero skill in. Take this character for example. He's the first character that I ever made and he has a poor distribution of attribute points. So he's struggling to level up. What I did was switch over from using one-handed to two-handed to increase my skill point gains and I'm now fighting on foot to match my writing, which is obviously much higher. This is one of the only ways to break out of that mid teen stalling point and to really drive this point home. Don't be afraid to invest all of your starting attribute and skill points 
during character creation in social and intellect. I promise it will make your mid to late game easier, especially when you have your own kingdom and you'll be happy that you can personally have an army well in excess of 200 soldiers alone because of your steward and leadership abilities. Now my last point is a pretty general one, but I really encourage you with your next playthrough, just take your time with the game. Even if you have a specific themed playthrough, don't rush to make the largest Flandian army or a huge Sturgian strike force. Travel across the map, find the companions you really want for your party, build up a small trade empire, or do the quests we mentioned earlier. The game was designed for you to take your time prior to becoming a mercenary. You'll find that you'll naturally get to a point where there's not much to do, but if that happens, try to talk to the kings of all the nations. They should have a special quest chain that starts with finding troops for a garrison. This quest chain, according to an internal beta tester, will shut off the second you become a mercenary. This point really resonates with my previous one about skill points. By taking your time, you should be able to acquire the necessary skills in steward and trade alone to really push your character level, leaving plenty of room for you to gain more experience from the endless combat you will undoubtedly be in. Uh, this is a mistake that I was making for almost all of my playthroughs until I talked to the internal tester who told me that the game was meant to be a slower form game. That the developers intended us to spend a good deal of time as a rogue minor faction before siding with a nation. And if you do, don't be afraid to ping pong around to the nation that has the most wars to get the most money out of your mercenary contract or any other way to keep yourself entertained before jumping into the vassal and kingdom system, especially as more of these mechanics are added to the game with each patch. With that, I hope that these tips really give you a really strong start to your next playthrough. With Beta Branch 1.4.2 having gone live just last week, hopefully you can use these tips to really put 1.4.2 through its works, as I find it to be a great patch with very little bugs and crashing. Or maybe you want to save some of these tips for the next Beta Branch and your return to the campaign. No matter what the case, I hope at least one of these points resonated with you. As always, thank you so much for watching here today, and if you have some tips that are really working out for you, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I always strive to have as much information for people to consume in the comment section as well as the content of these videos. If you're struggling with any specific portion of the game, I've linked my Bannerlord guides to the end of this video. Feel free to jump through some of those and find an answer to what you're looking for. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you do subscribe, go ahead and click the little bell next to the subscribe button. This is the button that will tell you about all of the many streams I do throughout the week, as well as the giveaways I host on said streams for a chance to win a copy of Bannerlord, Total War, or any other game I'm playing at the moment. Once again, thank you so much for watching today. Have a good one, and take care.